Hi everybody, Mike Kahn here. I'm gonna do a video about chapter 14 in Jensen's book, just kind of a preview of the uh, text. So uh, this uh, course, this art history course two, um, covers from the Renaissance to contemporary times. And chapter 14 in Jensen's art history talks about artistic innovations in 15th century Northern Europe. Particularly, they're going to be talking about the stuff that's happening. What's in modern day Italy? It wasn't called Italy at the time. It's a collection of small city states. This is very important to understand. At this time period, there's regional powers and they were all connected through religion. So, this is a fascinating thing. You had a centralized religion, Catholicism, and it's coming out of Rome. And you have the Pope which has tremendous amounts of power. And then you have these smaller city states that have their own power structures too. So you have Rome, but you also have Naples and Florence and you have um, the Veneto region, or that's just called Venice and you have Milan. And these different areas, they're kind of like regional authorities and they have their local rulers. Um, for example, in Venice, the ruler of the area is called the Doge, right? And they had a huge, uh, you know, kind of network of, of shipping, um, a, a, a huge navy, and uh, they were a, a centralized location for commerce. So it was kind of a meeting place of the East and the West. A lot of the traders from the East would come uh, through boats and then would, would connect with merchants in in Venice. <clears throat> but what's important to note is that this is the birth of the Renaissance and the Renaissance is a rebirth time period. It's looking back at uh, philosophy, Greek philosophy, humanism, and these ideas emerge. So, so the, when it says artistic innovations of 15th century Northern Europe, it's gonna start to talk about how the art drastically changes. It changes from the Gothic period and a, a prevalence on Christian story and, and Christian art uh, to an, an art that's exploring different themes. And also the, the technical ability of the art changes too, where it becomes much more detailed, much more comprehensive. And when we get to the high Renaissance, once we get to chapter 15, you're going to see an explosion of um, of like quality, of like a scope. So things will become very big and grand and the detail will become incredible. So chapter 14 is going to be what's kind of leading up. So we could call that like the pre-Renaissance. Sometimes it's called the international Gothic style. There's, there's different names over time. But you're going to look at works um, uh, from a sacred text. So you're you're going to be looking at like manuscripts and the paintings that are on manuscripts. You're going to be looking at um, some uh, uh, triptychs, which are altar pieces. Um, a lot of these pieces that we're seeing are removed from the context. The context would be, it would be in a church, either the back wall or on the side walls, they would have altars and they would have these panels that would open up. So, when the service was going on, they would open up so people could, could see it and there would be three panels. There'd be a main panel and two side panels. And when church was not in service, they would close it up and lock it up, right? And so if you look at Robert Campin, um, this triptych uh, where you see, um, you know, it, 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 it's showing uh, um, Mary and um, it's the, um, <clears throat> the angel um, Gabriel, I think. This is on page uh, 478. It might be a different page in your book, but it's called Robert Campin. It's an oil on panel um, triptych. And if you look, those panels have, have hinges. And so it kind of closes here. I'm gonna show this to you. It's a very fam famous piece. So you will see the triptych is the three different pieces. And it usually tells a story. So you'll see that a lot of the art from this time period has a narrative. 
right? Because it's connected to the biblical story. So here you have, um, you know, like one part of the story, second part of the story, third part. And I think this is, this is Mary, this is Joseph, he's in his workshop. This is an angel, I think it's Gabriel. And he is telling Mary, he's saying, you're going to have a baby, you're going to have baby Jesus. And there's this little um, ghost right up here. If you look, it's right in the corner. You probably can't see it in, in the video, but you'll see it in the book. That's the Holy Ghost. It's like coming down right into the belly. And this is um, the aunt and uncle. I forgot what, what um, it's the, uh, the uh, parents of um, John the Baptist, because they've received notice too that they're going to have a child. So they're coming to a talk to a Mary. So there's, there's a story go, going on, but what we're interested in is the context of how it fits within the church, how the style drastically change, changes, how we start to get depth in the painting. We see all these layers in the background. We start to see a basic uh, perspective in the background. That's kind of a unique thing that comes out of the Renaissance. And uh, stylistic changes where there's a lot more rendering, a lot more shadow and detail within the paintings. And so that's the uh, innovations that we start to see in 15th century Northern Europe. You can read about Jan van Eyck, um, a master painter, one of the first painters to experiment and use oil paints. Um, you're gonna see uh, a very famous piece called the Arnolfini Portrait. It's this one right here, you've probably seen it before. And it's noted for a couple different things. It's a marriage portrait, so you can think of it as like a marriage, you know, like when, when you get married, you, you take photographs. Well, you now photographs in this time period, so you would get your, your painting taken. He was a wealthy merchant from Venice, and um, uh, he hired Jan van Eyck to paint this portrait. Uh, so a couple things to, to, to note, the green wedding dress, the dog in the front that is a symbol of loyalty, the single candlestick that's above here, that is uh, the sign of unity, of marriage. And there's other references to marriage, the bed, the fruit, which is a symbol of fertility, the green of the grass, a symbol of fer fertility. The most famous thing, though, is this mirror in the background, the convex mirror. And you can read about that and how there's a reflection there of the painter himself. Um, but in that painting, we really start to see the Renaissance style, which is this grand scope, this really ultra detailed work, um, very lush, extremely high level of craftsmanship. And that's one of the things that makes <coughs> Renaissance art very stunning. You read about some outliers, some things that's outside of, of Italy. You'll read about um, Netherlands and uh, Bosch and the Garden of Earthly Delights. Um, and you'll see some kind of sculptural work. You'll see another altarpiece. Um, you know, if you ever travel to Europe and you go to the, the big Gothic churches or the different churches, you know, especially in, in, in a France, but um, um, I'm thinking about the churches that are scattered throughout um, Italy. Uh, <clears throat> there's an amazing amount of art by the altarpiece, which is these, these sections that are set off in the church where usually they'll, they'll have somebody buried and then beyond it, they'll, they'll be a piece of art, right? And, and sometimes this has a painting, but it also has sculptural elements in the, um, in the framing, in the architecture itself. Because often the whole area was designed by the artist, meaning that um, not just the painting itself, but also some of the surrounding things and like what the whole environment is going to be. And that's hard to get in a book is the context of, of the art being in the church and how it works with 
be a church. For example, one thing that's very common in the paintings is the artist often will take into account where the windows are in the church and then arrange the light in the painting to make it look like the light is coming from the windows, meaning that it's supposed to look like an extension of the space. So that if you're standing in the church looking at this altar, it seems natural. It seems like it's just a scene that's happening just right there. And it makes sense in the size relationships and the colors. It all works with the church and is all planned out that way. Many years later, hundreds of years later, thousands of years later, you know, some of these pieces are removed from a church and put into a museum. It loses its context. Or if someone takes a picture of it, it puts it into a book. We lose that context. So that's something to con consider is most of the artwork that we're looking at was designed to be seen in a church at an altar, either a high altar, which is the back one, or the side ambulatory areas. Um, but uh, read the text and um, there's a corresponding quiz about uh, how art drastically changes in this time period and then leads up to, to the Renaissance. Now, Donatello is often considered the first true like Renaissance artist. All the others before it are kind of a, a pre-Renaissance or what's leading up to the Renaissance. Now, there isn't a, I don't know, there's not a unified opinion. There's lots of different varying, um, timelines and like narratives, but uh, generally speaking, and what the text pre presents here is how um, time is changing and uh, how this, this time period, this uh, 15th century is like one of those periods in, in, in time where things kind of shift and start going in a different direction. And that different direction is we're going down the Gothic period where you're building these huge gigantic buildings and the emphasis is on the narrative of the Christian faith and trying to tell the story. And you start to have a little bit different um, worldview and a little bit different um, philosophy. A little bit of humanism comes in and artists become aware of some of the ancient works from Greece and Rome. And they start to take some of those artistic conventions and start to shift a little bit. And that's what the Renaissance, the Renaissance itself is a word that means rebirth or renewal. And what is it a renewal of? It's a renewal of classical themes in art, but it's a slight shift in that they don't go back and just copy they use some of the themes, but they still keep it within the Christian story. So you're telling the Christian story, but using a different artistic styles to, to do that. Okay, I hope that that makes sense. This is just a preview of chapter 14 in the book. Read the chapter and answer the uh, corresponding questions. And if you have any questions for me, you can email me at con at icc.edu. Thank you. Have a nice day.